Perspectives on EMDR Therapy and Sexual Health. The material in this webinar is based on the new professional text, EMDR Therapy and Sexual Health. And today's presentation will be presented by Stephanie Baird and um, Wendy Stock, Jean Folks, Ashley Mader, and Robert Miller. Stephanie Baird is an EMDR, uh, sorry, an EMDRIA approved consultant and has provided psychotherapy and programming on trauma, self care, burnout, vicarious trauma. EMDR and sexual health in various mental health settings since 1999. She has a certificate in advancing clinical excellence in sexuality and teaches sex education classes locally. She writes a locally monthly column on positive sexual health for the Montague Re Reporter newspaper. She loves empowering clients with sex positive information within her EMDR practice, recently publishing her first professional book, Integrating Those Two Areas, EMDR Therapy and Sexual Health, A Clinician's Guide, published by us at Springer. She is extremely grateful for the expert contributions to this new essential resource from many colleagues, several of which are here today presenting at today's webinar, and we greatly appreciate all collaborative um, opportunities. So welcome everybody. Um, uh, I will speak for a little bit, and then the next person will speak for a little bit. Lee will introduce each person when it's their time to speak, so you'll get to know a little bit about the person before they speak. Um, but thank you very much, Lee, for that wonderful introduction. Um, and here, uh, I believe everybody will get a copy of the slide deck uh, at the end. Um, so you'll have all of our contact information um, and all of the points that we're talking about throughout today. Uh, so no need to jot a lot of notes down or you know, anything like that. You will be able to have access to the slide deck and the webinar, the recorded webinar. Um, so welcome, welcome everybody. I believe we have people all the way from the uh, you know, beautiful coast of California, maybe having morning coffee to here in Massachusetts. Um, hopefully we've just had our lunch or we're gonna have our lunch right after this. Um, so welcome everybody, wherever you are in your day. Um, so I do wanna just continue to express, express a little bit more gratitude. Uh, this whole webinar today, all these collabor collaborations will not be possible without a huge amount of gratitude to people who've contributed different material and chapters to the books to the book, as well as my own EMDR mentors in the field. I was trained as an EMDR clinician first before I um, sort of re-began a foray into sexual health. Although I did start my sexual health interest back in college and we'll get to that in a minute. Um, but I'm fortunate to have many people contributing to this book, um, including the EMDR mentors, sexual health community, Springer Publishing, obviously, and many other um, consultees, colleagues, family, friends, and of course my clients. Without my clients, this book would, would not be possible um, as well as the webinar. So this is, you'll be learning a bit of information today for everybody, uh, some of our favorite tidbits that we like to share um, and important points that we think about a lot. Uh, obviously there's more information in the book. So this is also considered our sort of virtual book launch and celebration. So thank you all for helping us to celebrate this book. Oh, there we go. On EMDR therapy. Um, I, was conjecturing that perhaps some of the attendees here might not know much about EMDR therapy or may have heard the term or don't know, you know, too much in depth. So I've included this just to give us that little basic information. This is a text, this is a book integrating EMDR and sexual health. Um, so I, uh, EMDR therapy stands for eye movement desensitization and reprocessing therapy, um, which is an extensively researched and effective eight phase psychotherapy method that helps people recover from trauma and other disturbing life experiences, including PTSD, which was one of the original um, sort of uh, uh, diagnoses that EMDR was researched on, um, but also anxiety, depression, and other panic disorders. So this is from the MGA website, mga.org, for more general information, to watch informational videos about EMDR. If you're curious, you can go there. And there's a huge amount of information. Um, this has been around about 30, 30 plus years at this point in time. So we've been fortunate to have many double blind um, research studies coming through about EMDR and the effectiveness. 
It's uh, a World Health Organization listed uh, effective treatment for trauma, any kind of trauma. Um, so it's, you know, and once I got trained in it in 2009, I found it to be almost miraculous in the ways it helped my clients very quickly heal from trauma. So some people might wanna know what, what exactly happens in EMDR therapy. So basically we're giving attention, usually in the form of back and forth eye movements. So that's the bilateral stimulation and the word eye movement in this name of EMDR. Um, we give that attention to a negative image, a negative belief, an emotion and a body sensation related to that event. And we're trying to use that to reduce or get rid of the disturbance around that. And once that disturbance is gone, then we really try to install a positive belief that indicates the issue is resolved. So um, the quick example of a car accident, somebody is in a car accident on the highway. Um, three months later, they, they still don't want to go anywhere near the highway. They're very nervous. They're very anxious. They're having nightmares, you know, all those kinds of things. Through EMDR, we can uh, very quickly get rid of all that disturbance and then reinstall a positive belief of um, I can I can capably drive on the highway again. Um, so we move through these eight phases to allow the disturbing me uh, memory to be consolidated and stored more effectively, thereby allowing our adaptive and positive healing to emerge. Um, part of EMDR is the idea of um, adaptive information processing, that the mind body is always working towards healing. So we're just simply trying to facilitate that. Okay, so then why sexual health and EMDR therapy? <laughs> so, um, uh, as I alluded to, I did begin looking at sexual health uh, in college back in the 90s. Um, and, you know, in that time of taking some classes, discovering so much information nobody had provided to me, uh, it, you know, it was pretty mind blowing. Um, uh, it, it opened up an interest in that. But at the same time, I also encountered many people in my life, many friends who had um, experienced sexual assault, sexual abuse. And I felt uh, an even stronger pull towards um, working with folks um, who are sexual assault survivors and sexual abuse survivors. Um, so hence began clinical career and professional career. So years later, um, having done EMDR since 2009 uh, on a very regular basis, most of my practice actually, um, I did notice that, okay, that's great. A lot of people are really um, healing from their sexual trauma but then there's still not much information for them or help for them about sexual empowerment. So, and as I looked around at my colleagues, it was pretty much the same. You know, most EMDR therapists were all very comfortable with clients coming in. Oh, you know, I was assaulted. I think I have PTSD. We easily work with them and help them um, reduce or get rid of those PTSD symptoms. And then that's kind of it. It's like, okay, great. You know, I'm glad your nightmares are gone. I'm glad your PTSD is in remission. See you later. Um, and not many people are asking about sexual health and functioning. So this is an outgrowth of that big question, you know, uh, can we integrate sexual health more? What's stopping us from doing that? Uh, how can we really help our clients achieve full empowerment always? So, um, so we are, you know, with this topic today, we're trying to look at not just addressing the past, different past situations that people have gone through, helping them um, move through that distress, but how can we ensure that their present life and their future sex sexual health life is also as functioning, well functioning as possible and as empowered as possible. So, um, so to that end, I just want to say a couple little things about sexual health and sexual pleasure um, that most people never heard about at all or learned about this in any of their education. Um, there are organizations out there that have been working for a very long time on um, helping to define and uh, publicize the ideas of sexual health. Um, and just briefly, sexual health and sexual rights are fundamental for well being. Sexual health is a state of physical, mental, and social well being related to sexuality that requires a positive and respectful sexuality and sexual relations, as well as a possibility of pleasant and safe sexual experiences free from all coercion, discrimination, and violence. So, most people, if they even get any sex education in this country, which, by the way, only 24 states mandate any kind of sex education in public school. And of those 24 states, the amount of sex education from grades kindergarten through um, 12th grade ranges from one hour to six hours. So six full hours across 12 years of education. And none of those six hours 
are these ever mentioned? At least it wasn't when I was growing up and it still seems to not be today. Um, as somebody who teaches uh, local sex education classes outside of the school system, um, people come into those classes not having heard or read or understood anything about any of this. Um, so we have a huge gap and this huge gap leads to um, uh, you know, a lack of information, which does correlate with more rates of abuse. Um, so a couple other pieces I wanna just share with you today that I feel are just vitally important. Decla Declaration of Sexual Rights. So again, from that organization, World Association of Sexuality that's been working on this for a long time. These are just some of the rights. I'm not gonna read through them all. Um, you have them in your slide deck. Uh, but a couple of just things here, right to equality and freedom of sexual expression, the right to make decisions about one's body in regard to sexuality. So make your own decisions about your own body to be free from all sexual violence and coercion, um, the right to plan family planning resources. Uh, so those are a few of the sexual rights that have been around um, for quite some time. And more recently, um, this organization WAS has declared Declaration of Sexual Pleasure, which is incredible. So going from basic sexual rights to now the idea that we also have a right to pleasure. So a um, couple of these declarations, possibility of having pleasurable and safe sexual experiences, again, free of discrimination, free of violence, um, and that this is a fundamental part of sexual health and well-being for all. Um, access to sources of sexual pleasure is a part of the human experience. Um, it's a fundamental, sexual pleasure is a fundamental part of sexual rights as a matter of human rights, and also includes the possibility of diverse sexual experiences and so forth. So um, to me, these are some of the most important concepts that no one receives uh, for the most part. Uh, in the United States. Um, and I'm just happy to share them as much as I can and across many, as many groups as I can. And so now I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Stock, who was the person who sparked my interest and curiosity in sexual health way back in the early nineties at Texas A&M University. And I'm so delighted has, we've kept in touch and has contributed to this resource. Um, Dr. Stock, do you mind saying a couple things about you? I don't have the biography in front of me, unfortunately. Um, I have it in front of me, so okay, I can, great. Uh, Thank you so much. Okay. Um, I'm Dr. Wendy Stock. I did my undergrad at UC Berkeley and earned my doctorate at State University of New York at Stony Brook. Um, I was in academia for over 20 years. I have a number of professional publications. Right now, I'm in full-time clinical practice uh, and loving it. Um, my orientation is cognitive behavioral primarily, uh, and I identify as a feminist therapist. Um, so I think that's, that's enough, um, to orient people. Uh, so shall I go ahead with my presentation? Yes, please do. Thank you so much. Okie dokie. So, um, about the field of sex therapy to contextualize, uh, originally in the 1960s, sex uh, research provided a really physiologically based approach to sexuality and uh, some people colloquially refer to this as looking at the plumbing and the mechanics of sexual functioning all of that information was very relevant but not sufficient and sex therapy was viewed to some extent as uh, teaching people how to do organ grinding better um, but not looking at social context uh, this uh, approach is still reflected uh, to a large extent in our dominant diagnostic system, the DSM. There was a move, and it is continuing to the present from the 1980s on by feminist psychologists and therapists to uh, put the focus of sex within a social context. And so that's the context that I'm coming from as a feminist therapist and feminist sex therapist. So a feminist approach to sex therapy includes uh, the scientific knowledge, the physiological knowledge, uh, but also includes and adds recognition and willingness to intervene to address gender inequality, power differentials in relationships, valuing emotional and subjective aspects of sexuality, recognition that traditional sex roles underlie many sexual problems, and awareness of the role of sexual coercion, abuse, and trauma in causing sexual problems. Uh, in addition, there's an awareness of the relational context of sexual dysfunction uh, within a feminist approach to sex therapy. And I should say that 
uh, as a sex therapist, it's important uh, to address trauma first before doing work on sexual dysfunctions, that it's uh, almost impossible to proceed with sexual enhancement and enrichment if somebody's having flashbacks. So that's where approaches such as EMDR and other approaches, uh, prolonged exposure therapy uh, that are empirically documented as is EMDR, are really, really helpful and necessary to start out with. Uh, so that's the context of understanding where sex therapy fits. So one of the issues that comes up that's uh, a gender issue um, is a large gap in orgasm frequency between men and women, and this is specifically within heterosexual sexual activity, um, and it provides an illustration of relational factors on sexual problems. So um, research has found that approximately 75% of heterosexual men reported having orgasms during partnered sex on a regular basis. Only 29% of women reported the same. So why is this disparity that still continues to the present? Uh, it's been noted uh, for over four decades now. Um, other research has found that among women, those with more knowledge of the clitoris experienced orgasm more fre frequently on their own, but possessing this information was not related to frequency of orgasm with partners. So why, why is this that uh, information alone hasn't freed women to speak out on their own behalves? Uh, the way that uh, sexuality is uh, still constructed in heterosexual contexts is privileging men's sexual pleasure over women's such that orgasm for women is seen as pleasing but ultimately incidental. Um, women may not feel empowered or entitled to act on their sexual self-knowledge to ask for the stimulation that they need for fear of being seen as unfeminine, too demanding, <clears throat> and less desirable to their male partners. Um, the um, authors whose research I'm citing, Wade et al., are, um, said their findings are directly relevant to other means of safeguarding sexual health also, such as setting sexual boundaries and using condoms. So not only are many women unable to be assertive on behalf of their sexual pleasure, but also their safety. Um, there have been a number of studies also showing that many women fake orgasm, 58.8% uh, female participants, uh, mostly heterosexual, reported faking an orgasm at some point in time. And um, it has been looked at why do uh, women continue to fake orgasms? Uh, they were either, women indicated they were embarrassed to talk explicitly about sex with a partner. The, um, it was noted that uh, the youngest age bracket, women aged 18 to 24, were significantly more likely to say they did not know how to ask for what they wanted. Um, moving on to the next slide, um, I think we need, yes, um, corrective sex education, a radical concept. So this is um, one of the approaches that's been advanced to address uh, the disempowerment of women regarding our own sexuality. One of the leaders, the main uh, pioneer in this field is Leonor Tiefer. So she critiqued the sexual dysfunction nomenclature as far back as the late 80s uh, as omitting um, the social context and historical context um, of sexuality. She recommended feminist informed sex therapy to include corrective genital physiology education, assertiveness training, body image reclamation, and masturbation education. Uh, these are still uh, considered way radical uh, concepts within the field. Uh, so what does corrective sex education include? Addressing sex role e expectations, improving sexual communication, addressing relationship issues, concerning sexual initi initi initiation, timing, power issues in couples, sharing of the familial workload, examining unrealistic expectations, and learning to make sexual interactions more about connection than performance. Uh, this occurs all the time. These issues are relevant all the time in doing sex therapy with couples. Uh, for example, initiation, um, people um, don't initiate or often initiation occurs predominantly 
uh, more often still by male partners in heterosexual couples. And so that means the timing of an encounter may have nothing to do with when the female partner is in the mood, um, which reduces the likelihood that there's going to be as much um, pleasure in the situation. Um, some of the common persistent sexual myths, um, all people with vaginas should be able to orgasm through penetrative sex. Uh, and a big one, uh, sex is only good if you have an orgasm, uh, painful sex is normal, and one that I will elaborate a little bit on it because it's so common is um, that uh, the misunderstanding the significance of vaginal lubrication. It's commonly believed that the presence or absence of vaginal lubrication is an accurate indicator of female sexual arousal. So there's not a direct correlation between vaginal lubrication and this continues to be news to the majority of people I work with and people that I've taught uh, that uh, using that technique, a woman can be very lubricated at certain points during her menstrual cycle and not have anything to do with her level of arousal or might be very dry uh, but highly aroused. And so the, the recommendation is that it's best to ask the female partner uh, how she's feeling, what's going on with her. Is she ready to continue in sexual interaction uh, rather than using uh, lubrication as a dependent measure. That would, that would reduce a lot of uh, sexual pain and also uh, continuing with sexual penetrative sexual practices before a woman is really ready. Um, next slide. So um, lastly, um, it has been thought that women and I believe that if women had a better image, internalized image of what their uh, sexual physiology and anatomy looked like, that they might feel more empowered to be assertive on their own behalf. I don't think that's the entire solution, but this is a picture from a book uh, that came out in the 80s and is still in press by Susan Gage called A New View of a Woman's Body. And this is the often the first picture that people have ever seen of the erect clitoral body. So the clitoris has largely been thought of just that little knob at the end, uh, like a tiny little button, but underneath the uh, vulva, there's this entire erectile structure that has as many cc's of, uh, of spongy erectile tissue as men have in their penises. So um, I believe that if, if women had the idea that they have an organ that gets erect as that's just as important as male partners, that they might feel more empowered to speak on their own behalf. However, um, it has been found that information alone isn't the solution, that we also need to address um, the uh, social uh, context for which women are disempowered during sex. So the last thing that I'll mention is this great book called Rethinking Sex by Christine Emba, in which she suggests quite radically that uh, we should focus on wanting to find partners who are, are as concerned with one's own pleasure as their own, and that sex might be better placed within a context of mutual caring. That, that does not mean within the context of long-term committed relationships only, but even in hookups, that uh, mutual caring and respect would be something that we need to encourage people to insist on. One of the things that undermines that, in my view, is the um, role of pornography in shaping expectations about sex and often being the main form of sex education to young people in our culture. They often have exposure to that much more commonly and over and over again compared to the brief amount of sex ed if they get any. Uh, in, in schools or from parents. And so they're getting images of these acts that have often nothing to do with pleasure, particularly women's pleasure, over and over again. And girls, as well as boys, are growing up to feel that this is sex. And they don't have the context to understand, no, this is like not an accurate representation and not and is just, quote, entertainment. Um, so what we, we need to do is uh, incorporate much better sex ed uh, to counteract uh, the, uh, the cultural um, forces that exist that construct sexuality in a way that has nothing to do with pleasure and everything to do with objectification. 
um, at this point I'm done and I will turn it over to Dr. Folks. Good afternoon. This is uh, Gina Martinez with Springer Publishing, and I am pleased to uh, introduce Dr. Jean Folks. She is a licensed professional counselor and EMDRIA approved consultant who has been in a private practice in Avon, Connecticut for 40 years, specializing in trauma recovery with individuals, groups, and through workshops. As a doctor of ministry from the School of Theology at Claremont, uh, Dr. Folks believes every life freed is a contribution to a peaceful world. To that end, she welcomes the inclusion of spiritual resources in her work with people of diverse faith traditions. Jean taught adjunctly for many years at Central Connecticut State University, Department of Psychology, as well as Clinical Medicine and Mind-Body Medicine at the University of Connecticut School of Medicine. Retirement from teaching has freed Jean to concentrate more fully on professional consultation, sustaining season, seasoned clinicians, as well as passing on her clinical experience to a new generation of trauma therapists. Welcome, Jean. Thank you, Gina, and thank you, Dr. Stock going to switch gears just a little bit and talk about the intersection of spirituality and sexuality in a little bit more specifically EMDR focused way. Um, I am great, so grateful that uh, Stephanie was willing and enthusiastic uh, about including this chapter in her landmark uh, book. So that is all good news because actually spirituality and sexuality have a tremendous amount of overlapping convergence that um, is really important to understand if we are going to maximize the healing potential for our clients. So first off in history taking, we want to find a common language with the client, um, the word God, masculine pronouns is not necessarily going to work for everybody and could actually be offensive or triggering or shut down a, a further dialogue about um, the spirituality that they experience for themselves. So being open to their language, uh, being open to the possibility that much of their spirituality may not be held in language. It may be held more in a visceral way as sensation, or there may be more visual, visual metaphor uh, that makes sense to them. And joining them in, in their lexicon is going to get us uh, the most spacious room uh, in, in their world. And that's gonna make all the difference as we try to formulate EMDR targets and find negative cognitions. In the process of talking about spirituality and a client's spiritual life, we're already going to be identifying woundedness. Um, many times uh, a client will talk about being a lapsed something, um, or I used to, or I grew up in this or that tradition, but I really don't practice it now. So we also want to be really interested in, so how did that evolution happen? You know, you started here in your childhood, now you're here. What happened? What changed? What made a difference? And getting that information can really tip us off to uh, woundedness that still needs to be addressed around spirituality. Because both spirituality and sexuality so often in, involve sensation, um, involve vulnerability, and you know, involve a sense of, of longing. We can begin to see how spirituality and sexuality and woundedness can collide. It may happen on one pole or the other. For example, there may be a negative cognition like, I must sacrifice pleasure to please the divine. Or on the other pole, sex is the only road to having spiritual experience. Or we can see 
a, a complete shutdown on both poles in terms of spirituality and sexuality, and there being very, very limited access to either one. And then we're usually looking at somebody who's pretty shut down in their body and potentially dissociative. So if we can have the next slide, please, Steph. Thank you. So we want to keep track of ecstasy and longing. Ecstasy is that very deep, unique human experience that is transcendent and beyond our, our normal expectations for emotional experience in our lives. For people who have injury in their spirituality or in their sexuality, um, an ecstatic experience can be deeply longed for, but completely unobtainable. And in looking at that, again, we see the convergence of the two. When there is an injury to spiritual connection, um, we can see a person sometimes deeply seeking some kind of ecstatic experience through sexual expression to the point where it can become somewhat addictive. And a person, for example, could go from one night stand to one night stand and always seeking this ecstatic experience that would satisfy that spiritual place, but never quite get satisfied. And the reverse can also be true. Uh, so we, we want to be aware of the cross-triggering of spiritual and sexual longing, spiritual and sexual dysfunction, and the, the relationship between the two. When both are seriously compromised, then we're looking at a great deal of, of repression, often depression across the board, and a lack of sense of permission and entitlement to be fully human, which requires having access to emotions, to physical sensations, and to sexual desire. So as we formulate these negative cognitions of what is allowed and not allowed, um, using the client's spiritual language, we begin to be able to set our targets. And if we can have the last slide, please, Stephanie, thank you. And ultimately, it really is all about relationship relationship to self, relationship to the divine as it's understood by the client, and the client's perception of how the divine relates to them. Is it judgmental? Is it dogmatic? Are there lots of rules and regulations? Is there pleasure and delight in the person's aliveness? All of this is relational in nature as is sexual encounter, which is about intimacy and knowing and being known by another human being and having the safety and the platform of safety and support to be vulnerable. As healing progresses and we go from God will hate me if I engage in sex um, or my higher power won't allow me to have a sexual experience or, you know, I have to pray constantly to stay in the good graces of my higher power. As that resolves, as we connect with the feeder memories that have created those negative cognitions, and as we get the client down to a, a zero suds, because we take a measurement of distress, zero being a calm body, not necessarily a lack of feeling. 
then we can be looking at positive cognitions that both resonate spiritually and sexually. For example, it's safe to be both a sexual and a spiritual being, or the divine, or my higher power, or God delights in my sexual pleasure. And then, and this is so important for EMDR therapists to bear in mind, to move further and use the future template and invite the client to envision sexual experience in their future with their partner, with an imagined partner or with themselves. Uh, and to take the positive cognition with them into that imagined moment with the bilateral stimulation of EMDR and to help them more deeply um, embed subcognitively and on a cellular level, the truth of this new, much more adult focused here and now perception of a freedom in body, mind and spirit. So I hope that gives you uh, some new thoughts about how to include uh, both a spiritual and a sexual awareness around your client's woundedness in EMDR therapy. And I will pass things along to uh, Dr. Mader. Uh, good afternoon. I'm gonna introduce uh, Dr. Ashley Mader. Um, Ashley Mader uh, is a psychotherapist, coach, and consultant specializing in sexuality, aging, and family systems. Uh, Dr. Mader received her master's in social work and doctorate in human sexuality from Widener University in Pennsylvania. Throughout the years, Dr. Mader has presented at numerous national conferences on sexuality and aging. From 2016 to 2020, Dr. Mader co-hosted the podcast, Our Better Half. In 2018, she began the postgraduate program at the Bowen Center in Georgetown and has been attending it for the past four years and is currently an intern there. Dr. Mader has a private practice in Western Massachusetts. Welcome, Dr. Mader. Thank you, Gina, and thank you, Dr. Folks. I just wanted to start off with some basic um, aging statistics. So as of 2020, 20% of the population in the United States was above the age of 65. Um, so in my dissertation research, I um, studied the experiences of older adult sexuality as they age. And what I found out in my research, not only with the, the participants in my study, but also in my literature review, that the frequency of sex am amongst older adults does decrease. However, um, it might also change the types of sex that they might be having, such as they might be having more solo sex or masturbation. Uh, men are more likely to be sexual compared to women, but this isn't necessarily due to the stereotypes, which I will get to later, about men being more sexual. It actually might be due to the lifespan of women compared to men. Women are more likely to be widowed and live six to eight years longer than men. The other thing that I found out when I was doing my dissertation, a lot of the women who uh, I interviewed it wasn't that they did not want to, they, they had a low sexual desire. It was the fact that they didn't have a partner. And that was also consistent with the, the research that I read as well, that the, the, one of the major reasons that women are not, um, older women are not sexual has to do more so with the lack of a partner rather than the willingness. Um, physical limitations and health is another reason that sexual frequency may decrease. So this might be high cholesterol, um, high blood pressure, also, you know, arthritis and different physical limitations um, that might cause problems with mobility. The, the other thing too that causes um, problems with sexuality is some of the medications that older adults may be on that might cause sexual dysfunction, whether it's delay in orgasm, erectile dysfunction. Uh, if people and educators and therapists would broaden their ideas of what sex is, that sex isn't just intercourse, that there's outer course, there's so many rich ways to explore one's sexuality, this might not be as problematic. And the other um, 
statistic that half of the people currently living with HIV and AIDS are over the age of 50. And the reason might be is like with baby boomers and older, they really only had to worry about preventing pregnancy and maybe syphilis. Um, but with, you know, Gen X, millennials, Gen Z, HIV and AIDS has always been something that has been something that they, they've known. So when after menopause and that there's no chance of getting pregnant, safer sex methods might not be used. Hence why there is more um, older adults living with HIV and AIDS. Um, next slide, please, Stephanie. So just a few biological changes um, in women and men. So women experience menopause. And also just like a quick tidbit, fun piece of information that the only mammals that experience menopause other than human um, women are orcas, um, narwhals, beluga whales, and pilot whales. So I just think that's a really interesting, I could go an entire um, presentation on just menopause and um, menopause and, and the animal kingdom. Uh, so other changes that happened are vaginal changes such as dryness and atrophy. Um, orgasms may change. Orgasms may become shorter in duration. They also may not. Um, hormone replacement therapy may help alleviate some menopause discomfort, but not all individuals are good candidates for HRT. This is something that is really important to talk to one's primary care doctor or um, gynecologist about. Um, so men... For men, erections um, start to change after the age of 40. So a lot of time, there's not enough, I mean, we all have you know, the, the sex ed that we receive at puberty, but we might not have, which is not, we also need it in later stages in life, like what is happening to our bodies? So men don't always know that you know, it's normal for erections to start changing after the age of 40. They might become less firm. They might, there might not be, there might be more of a refractory period between erections. But a lot of times men interpret this as, oh my goodness, this is erectile dysfunction. And there's a lot of anxiety buildup around it. Therefore, when they do engage in sex, the anxiety is causing the um, erectile dysfunction, not necessarily any biological. Um, and so that's extremely important for um, people to know. Um, so by the age of 70, though, 70% 70 of men will have experienced erectile dysfunction in their life. So that is um, something also that it is also very normal that can happen. There's also changes in ejaculation and, and a large prostate can also cause sexual issues. And there are, there is a such sexual desire change in both men and women there. It might not be as strong. It might not. Um, so it's just something to be aware of with uh, the, how biologically people change. Um, next slide, please. So something really important to um, know is that there are an estimated 1.5 million LGBTQ adults over the age of 65 in the United States. Um, LGBTQ adults may not have as much support in their lives uh, and only 50% of older adults who live in nursing homes or assisted livings feel comfortable being out. So it, this might also be changing, but as of now, um, a lot of times um, older adults may feel like they have to go back in the closet if they're going to be in a nursing home or an assisted living. Um, so there is a fear amongst especially transgender older adults that if there is, if they do live in a, um, there is a fear amongst transgender older adults that if they do live in a nursing home, their gender may not be affirmed and they'll experience transphobia. Um, and there, there's in major cities right now, there are a few more assisted living and nursing home communities that are targeted more to LGBTQ adults. There also are more um, nursing homes that have sexual health policies. Um, in place so older adults can experience sexuality. Um, I think the Hebrew home in, Bron in the Bronx is one of them. Um, last slide, please. So just to kind of wrap up, the ageism and stereotypes are something that older adults may uh, experience. So these stereotypes and myths start uh, at about sexuality start young. Um, if you think about what 
a person may see when they're younger about what older adults and sexuality um, look like. It's either, it's usually through the lens of like a laughter curtain that it's more comical or the, um, or it's more like, oh, isn't that cute? So they're more infantilized or thought of as asexual that older adults are not sexual. Um, so, and then there's the other stereotypes that are the cougar, dirty old man or sweet grandmother, grandfather. So these stereotypes are, can be internalized. So older adults may be like, oh, okay, well that ship has sailed. I don't really need to be sexual anymore. And, and I think it's interesting with ageism, you know, out of all the isms, this is the one, like, like what is the use of being prejudiced against a, and there's no use of prejudice anyway, but what, like be prejudiced against a population that you want may one day join. So I just think that's really interesting. So these stereotypes may be internalized and older adults may not seek the care that they need from healthcare providers. So they might not think that their sexuality is important. So they might not talk about it. They feel uncomfortable. A lot of these doctors may be the age of their children or grandchildren. So there's definitely a discomfort there. But alternatively, healthcare providers may not inquire about sexual lives of older adults due to their own discomfort. So this can be combated by having more sexual education in medical schools, more um, in the mental health field, et cetera. And I'm gonna pass this off to Dr. Miller. Thank you. And it is my pleasure uh, to introduce our final presenter, Dr. Robert Miller. Dr. Miller is the developer of the Feeling State Addiction Protocol, FSAP, which eliminates the positive feeling linked with behavior and substance addictions. He has published peer-reviewed articles on the F FSAP. Dr. Miller is also the developer of Image Transformation Therapy, IMTT, which is an entirely new approach to psychological treatment. He has authored both he has, he has authored books on both the FSAP and IMTT. He is currently in private practice in Del Mar, California. Welcome, Dr. Miller. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to talk about out of control behavior. Uh, feeling states, out of control behavior is caused by out of control sexual behavior and actually other types of uh, behavioral addictions are caused by what's what's called a feeling state a feeling state is a positive feeling that is fixated with a sexual behavior in terms of sexual addiction um so that what you're looking at is that a very intense positive feeling becomes rigidly linked with a behavior and that in order for for the person to experience that feeling, they have to do that behavior. And that's what causes out of control sexual behaviors. And the treatment is to break that fixated link between the feeling and the behavior. And then the person just doesn't want to do the behavior anymore. And this includes both acting out sexual behaviors in terms of uh, doing it with another person, as well as pornography. Next slide, please. So let's talk about what particular positive feelings we're talking about. We're not talking about sexual excitement. Um, the problem that out of control sexual behavior in terms of treatment has had in the past is that while people have known that it felt good, that there was a pleasurable sensation there, a pleasurable feeling, What's important is that you must identify the very specific positive feeling the person is looking for. And these positive feelings include feeling desired, feeling important, feeling special, feeling accepted. In other words, very normal kinds of feelings that everybody wants. But because of the person's history, they ended up creating what's called a feeling state a memory that links a positive, intensely desired positive feeling with a particular behavior. And in order for the person to get that feeling, they do the behavior. And using EMDR with bilateral stimulation, by focusing on that feeling state memory, 
You can break the fixation between the feeling and the behavior. And then once you do that, once you break that fixation, behavior immediately changes. I want to really emphasize this. This is when I first started doing lectures on the FSAP, the Feeling State Addiction Protocol, this was quite controversial because people are saying it takes a long time for behaviors to change. And I hear all the time that people are saying that feeling that sexual out of control sexual treatment or sex addiction treatment takes a long time, years, takes, they have to manage the behavior. Sexual abstinence is important. They do groups. Well, the, problem, the reason why it takes so long is because they're not processing the right thing. You have to process the feeling state memory in order to eliminate that psychological dynamic in the person. Next slide, please. So here's an example of what I'm talking about, of how it started and how we eliminated it. Don's problem, problematic sexual behavior began in college. And what his out of control behavior was, was he always had to have first time sex with a woman. And, and once he had done that, it, it, having sex again with the same woman didn't satisfy that urge. He had to go find another woman to have sex with. He came into therapy because after 20 years of marriage, he had finally gotten caught. And um, now the question is, is why, what was he doing? Well, Don's sexual behavior began in, out of control sexual behavior began in college when he wanted to have a relationship with a specific woman. And she kept him at a friend's distance for about a year. And then they started a sexual relationship. And the intensity of that first time of having sex was so strong that the feeling state formed of the feeling of acceptance linked with first time sex. So whenever he needed to feel a feeling of acceptance, he had to go and get have a, have a sexual relationship for the first time with a woman. By breaking that linkage between the feeling of acceptance and the behavior of first time sex, Don's behavior immediately stopped. He was no longer interested in doing that sexual behavior. It literally took one processing session to process that feeling state. Next slide, please. And when a, for all of the conventional wisdom that it takes so long to resolve sexual out of control sexual behaviors or sex addiction, sex addiction is actually out of control sexual behaviors are actually some of the easiest behaviors to treat. And the reason is because whether it's an out of control sexual behavior in terms of acting out or whether it's pornography, people have found what really it is that turns them on to particular behaviors that stimulate that particular feeling of like acceptance or being special or feeling desired that they're really wanting. Because in, in FSAP treatment, the, challenge, the biggest challenge is to identify the feeling state, the, excuse me, to identify the positive feeling. And once you identify the positive feeling link with that particular part of the behavior, then the processing it is very simple, just using a f whatever form of processing you do, whether if EMDR bilateral stimulation to process that memory. And once you do, the feeling state is broken. And after you, so even though it, it, so it takes at most two to three sessions, and that's including history taking in order to resolve the out of control sexual behavior. Then the treatment can then turn to focus on the psychological dynamics that cause the person to create that feeling state memory to begin with. 
because if they didn't have some fundamental reasons why they needed that behavior so intensely, it wouldn't have, have become a fixated memory when they finally were able to experience that feeling. But even if you don't process the underlying issues, nevertheless, the feeling state and the out of control behaviors will be gone immediately. Next slide, or I think that's it. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> Turn this over back to the. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Oh my goodness, what a wealth of information. Um, check in. I'm trying looking into the Q and A, looking at some questions that have come through. Ah, we have an Aloha from Hawaii. Um, uh, we're gonna try to let's see um, if we can go through these questions quickly. So I think there's one. It's like for Dr. Mater about the introduction of HAART therapies and PrEP help explain why 50% of those living with HIV spectrum disease are over 50. Do you have an answer for that? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's definitely a possibility. I, I, that's something that I don't know whether it's probably, a, but I haven't seen the studies on that, but that absolutely makes sense that it could also contribute to why there's more older adults over the over 50 living with HIV and AIDS than younger their younger counterparts. Thank you for the question. Okay, awesome. Um, Aloha from Hawaii. So looking for a list of negative cognitions, positive cognitions related to sexual health to help facilitate AMDR. So actually in this book, there are several tables that exactly have that. Um, and I might have like a couple slides somewhere else about that. If you want to shoot me your email, and my email will be at the end of this webinar um, pres uh, slide presentation then I can send you at least uh, you know, some copies of those few slides that I've got with that stuff. Um, definitely feel free to uh, get a copy of the book for 30% off um, where there's a couple chapters really looking more in depth onto that, into that. Another question, are there online resources, video protocol documents that go along with this textbook? So the textbook actually has several protocols in it. Um, this, will, this is the video, uh, this one hour webinar will be available, I believe for viewing later. Um, there is a, a two hour um, webinar that was done in March through our local Western Mass EMDR group. So if you email me um, and interested in that, the two hour is more in depth, way more detailed and more EMDR focused. Uh, I can try to work something out around that. Um, also there, I wanted to mention this at some point. So the National MGO Conference, which is the National Conference for EMDR is gonna be in September. It'll be virtual this year um again uh but there will be a three hour symposium on this exact topic so we'll get to have three hours to really dive into all of this information with some uh, uh more emdr focused contributors since it is an emdr conference um but certainly keep your eyes out for the indria um you know conference registration information coming through if you're on the emdr listservs and uh, if you belong if you're a member of mga and then here's a question for dr miller do you by any chance uh, have any EMDR trainings that are focused on sexual behaviors? So Dr. Millen, do you have any webinars or are you having upcoming trainings focused on using the FSAP with um, sexual behaviors? Uh, the answer is yes. I, I don't have a live one right now, but on my website, you can find an on-demand um, webinar for uh, training on the FSAP. Awesome, fantastic. And so, um, his website is in the beginning of this slide deck. Again, everybody will get the slide deck. Um, and yeah, let me just, yep, I can just jump in from Springer Publishing. Um, yeah. If you've forgotten to ask any questions or uh, you have any comments to make, there will be a post survey following this webinar where you can put all of that in there and we will make sure uh, that we get back to you. Um, if you can advance the next slide. We uh, are off also offering you today a 30% discount to purchase the presenter's book. Uh, you just have to uh, include the discount code Baird30 at springerpublishing.com, uh, springerpub.com at checkout, and you will receive a 30% discount on the presenter's book today. Um, we'd like to thank the presenters for taking the time to host this webinar with us and for all of you for attending today. Uh, everybody stay safe and be well, and we will see you next time. Uh, just this webinar is being recorded and will be uh, available on springerpub.com slash video backslash videos in about seven business days.
So thank you to all of our presenters and to everyone who joined us today. Be well. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.